Welcome to episode 17 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at sellingyourscreenplay.com. In this episode's main segment, I interview writer-director Martin Gooch. Martin is a hardworking filmmaker who has completed two feature films in the last 18 months. We talk about the details and the realities of being an independent filmmaker in 2014. He's got a very interesting story, and what I love about it is that he succeeded through his own will and determination. If you find these episodes valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes, or if you're watching this on YouTube, please give it a like and leave a comment. I want to improve this podcast, so some honest, constructive feedback is very much appreciated. Please also share these podcast episodes with anyone who you think could get some value out of them. I'd like to thank Rod Wilson and Constance Nunn, who left me some nice comments over on the YouTube. <clears throat> a couple of quick notes. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at, at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcasts. Also, if you want my free guide, How to Sell Your Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide, how to write a professional logline and query letter, how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. It really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide to pick that up. A quick few words about what I'm working on. So as I mentioned on the last few episodes of the podcast, I did finish my limited location horror thriller screenplay, and I have begun to aggressively market it. I thought I would just run through all the various things that I do when I finish a script so that people can see what my current marketing plan looks like. But keep in mind, this is a fluid plan with each script. I alter it a little bit. I tweak it and I'm always trying new things and I'm always trying to get new things into this plan. Just see what works. And, and if I see any light on at any of these things that I'm doing, I really try and push hard in that direction. So the first thing I do is polish the log line. I always write the log line before I even write the script. So this is pretty easy. It's just a matter of tweaking it a little bit and making sure it's as good as possible. Then I write a one to two page synopsis. I'll need that for my website. Other sites um, will allow you to upload a synopsis like InkTip. And in some cases, producers will ask for a synopsis before they agree to read the whole screenplay. So it's good to have a synopsis written and ready to go because you probably will need it. But I don't include that in the query letter. I then write my query letter. And again, this is pretty easy. I mean, a lot of it is just copying and pasting. I've written so many query letters. My, my bio, the bio section of my query letter hasn't changed dramatically. So it's just tweaking it, cleaning up again, pretty simple, easy, easy bit. It's basically, um, the query letter is basically the log line, a quick pitch of the screenplay and a short summary of my, um, screenwriting credits. So right after the log line, I pitch the screenplay. In this case, I'm pitching it as hostile meets deliverance. And then I have a sentence and where I talk about the fact that the script is only 85 pages long. It has a limited cast, limited location. So it could be shot on a very limited budget. This is a real selling point of this screenplay. So I want to make that absolutely clear in the um, query letter. So then I go to the WGA website and I register the script with the WGA. Eventually I will send it to the Library of Congress too, but um, in the short term I just get the um, WGA registration. Some producers, when I do these blasts, they will ask me to sign a release form and you'll need the WGA number for most of those release forms. So you want to get that as soon as possible. And it's a, it's a good idea just to protect your script too, just in general, but you definitely want to get it um, to the WGA. And again, I do recommend also sending to the Library of Congress, but I'm not in a rush to do that right now. I then upload the log line, the pitch, and the synopsis to my website. You can take a look at that at ashleymyers.com if you're curious to see the actual information. Again, that's www.ashleymyers.com. Then I upload the script to InkTip, replacing the script that I had listed in their database. They have a variety of services, but one of the services is you can list your script in their database and then producers can find it. And you tag it with a bunch of 
you know, genres and keywords and that kind of thing. So the producers can search through their database and find stuff. And when you upload something new, you seem to get a good number of hits. So it's good to just constantly put something new in there. You can get do this for as many scripts as you want. I typically only have one script at a time and I just keep replacing that listing. Then after um, Inktip, I uploaded the script to um, the Blacklist site. Um, you know, you pay for one month, and I also paid for one review. So it's $25 for the month to host, and then the one review is um, $50. So that's $75. My thinking here is if I get a good first review, I will buy a second review. But if the first review tanks, I probably won't bother. I did interview Franklin Len Leonard a couple of episodes um, ago on the podcast. So if you have questions about the Blacklist podcast, or the Blacklist website, rather, um, definitely go back and listen to that. And we really go into some of the nuts and bolts of that. So then the final thing I do is I use my own email and fax blast service. In this case, I decided to go ahead and do a blast to my agents and managers list and also my producers list all on the same day. The responses start to come in almost immediately. One thing I noticed, and this is kind of a... Um, it's a little bit of a mistake that I made. I did the blast the Monday after Easter and I got a ton of automated vacation replies and I think that's going to hurt me. My fear is, is that when people get back from vacation, their inboxes will be so full. They won't give my query letter much of a look because they'll be trying to just jam through a ton of email. So that's one lesson I learned. Try and stay clear of any and all holidays. People do take, you know, extended days off in and around those holiday weekends. Anyway, I then usually let the responses pile up for a few days, usually until Wednesday or Thursday. So if I do a blast on a Monday or Tuesday, I'll let the responses just pile up for, for two or three days till Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, and then I will run through them all and reply. Just I'll run through them all in one big batch, one big session. Um, it's just a little more efficient this way than, than to onesie and twosie the responses off. You will have to fill out some um, release forms. And again, just doing these as onesies and twosies can be time consuming, but doing them all as a batch is a little bit um, a little, just a little bit more efficient and I don't think it's a big deal to wait a day or two or three days so that's not a big deal so that's actually what I've done um, that's actually what I've been doing this morning before recording this podcast was I was actually just finishing up um, submitting back the script to the people that requested it so now it's just a matter of waiting for a few weeks and seeing if anything hits the one other thing I did, um, I forgot to mention this. One other thing I did right before doing the email and fax blast, I emailed a list of about 15 to 20 producers or development you know, executives who have read some of my material in the last few years and have showed some genuine interest in one or more of my screenplays. These are people that I sent the screenplay to. They responded by saying, we like it, but it's not quite right. And it's generally, sometimes, sometimes people will say we like it, but it's not quite right. And really that's a way of saying we didn't like it. But sometimes I get in extended conversations with people. Sometimes I actually meet the people. Sometimes I talk to the people on the phone. And if I, I kind of try and create a list of people. And in Gmail, you can just create a folder or a, a tag and I tag these as you know people who show genuine interest in my writing and and as I said I right now I have sort of 15 20 people which I correspond with frequently um, some of the people I've met but but I genuinely think that they do really like my writing and so I went out to them first um, and and I really should do more of this sort of try and cultivate these relationships but in in, in most of the time I mean obviously this um, taking a step back. This is obviously a more custom email. This is not just my pat query letter that I send to them. I custom write each email, you know, mentioning that we that we met or talked on the phone or mentioned the other script that they read and liked. Um, nearly all of these people will read the script because again, they've shown genuine interest in something I've written in the past. So it's a pretty good way to just jump start your um your sort of marketing for your script. So that's basically everything I've done to market this first screenplay. Um, I'll hopefully have an update in the near future with some good news. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I have an interview with writer-director Martin Gooch. He's a very hard-working, determined director who's managed to get two films produced in just the last 18 months. So it's pretty impressive. Here is the interview. Welcome, Martin, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate your coming on the show. Yeah, it's, oh, it's fabulous to be here, even though I'm not actually there. So you have two feature films coming out this year. Congratulations on that. 
Thank you very much. Sure. And um, can you give our listeners just a quick overview of your career, sort of how you got to the point where you are now, um, really taking us all the way back to the very start? Yeah, sure. Uh, a, a very, very quickly one. Uh, when I was a little boy, uh, I went to the cinema. My aunt took me and I fell in love with the movies when I was about five. And uh, we never we didn't watch TV and we hardly went to the movies. So it was a real special treat to go to the movies and I realised that I always wanted to do that, you know, that, that I sort of got that, I want to make movies at a very, before I was 10. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously in the 80s in the UK, and my mum and dad, who are brilliant people, but are not filmmakers, how do you get into the film industry? No internet, no uh, DCL, DL, uh, DSLRs, no flip cameras, no nothing. Uh, so I couldn't. <laughs> so I actually became an archaeologist and I went to work right. for the US forest service in california i worked in modoc county in a tiny little beautiful town called alturas near mount shasta and it was wonderful and i'm still touched with those guys but i wanted to be a filmmaker and i, I reapplied to the uk uh, and i got into an art course so i came all the way back um i actually went to la la the day of the rodney king riots when i was 19 and I thought, why are there tanks here? I don't understand. And then someone said, there's riots, you need to go. So I left. <laughs> uh -huh, huh. And uh, I, I did a degree in, in film. I got a job as a runner, uh, a visual effects runner on Judge Dredd, the, the Sylvester Stallone movie in 1994. We shot it. Um, so the very first job I had was on the biggest film that had ever been made in the UK at that time. It was a pretty amazing experience. And I went back to college and I realized that there was nothing more to learn at college from my particular tutors uh, because I'd already done a movie and uh, they hadn't done anything. It, uh -huh. and, uh, although I had a lovely time at college and I would recommend go to college kids. It's good. Um, I, That's, that sums up my college experience yeah, as well. I suddenly realized I was, a, I'd started off there and before I finished the college, I was there uh, and my tutors uh, were lovely people, but they're tutors. And uh, then I became a clapper loader, which is a second AC uh, in America, obviously. And I did a whole load of films and I went to Australia and I did a whole load of films in Australia as an AC. And then I came back and I was lucky enough to get on some really great films. Like we shot bits of Muppets, Treasure Island and bits of Harry Potter and did the Quidditch matches in uh, Harry Potter one uh, as an AC. And um, uh Lots of other films, lots of dreadful, dreadful films that you've never, ever heard of, and quite rightly so. Sure, sure. But you're getting a good technical background. Like, you're building up this sort of technical film knowledge all throughout this. Yeah, and on, on set decorum, mm -hmm. how to behave on a feature set is essential. And, I, and I, I teach, you know, screenwriting hilariously, having just slagged off a whole load of educators. I, that's what, something else I do. And um, uh, I find that a lot of the students today and uh, they come onto a film set, they don't know how to behave. And, uh, and, I, and I find that that's because nowadays, because you can get a DSLR and go and shoot something and become a director on day one, you, you didn't learn the path. And I, and I think that being an assistant, even just on one movie, is the best education you'll ever get, because you will see top of their game, heads of department, DOPs, gaffers, grips, makeup people, script supervisors. You see all those wonderful people doing their job at a highly professional level. And then you can work out where you fit into this. And if you're lucky, uh, you're working with a director who's good. I mean, the funny thing, someone said to me the other day, which directors did you work with were really good? And I went, ah, oh, I can tell you which ones were really bad. Uh, uh, and then I had to really think because... Unfortunately, good directors, a few and far between, if you think how many films are out there and how many individual directors have an have a individual print on their film, then it's not so many, unfortunately. But that's rock and roll. And then uh, I made a lot of short films, uh, and two of them got selected for Best New Director for the BBC. I got two years in a row, which was really cool. Uh, and the BBC phoned me up and asked me in and said, hey, we like your stuff. Uh, we'd like to give you a job. And they gave me a job directing this daytime drama called Doctors, uh, which is like the English version of ER, but much, much smaller budget. And uh, that's been on telly for 10 years. And, uh, and I did a whole load of them and okay. really uh, learned my 
you know, on set directing skills because you're doing 28 pages a day of scripted drama. Wow. Yeah, you shoot an hour and a half in, um, of TV, three episodes in seven days. And uh, it's really, really fast. It's as fast as you can go and have any degree of quality, any faster than that, and the, you start getting lamps down, uh, you know, boom. <laughs> and that. Yeah. Props in the wrong place. And then I've got another job uh, on the back of that called Hollyoaks, which is a really popular uh, sort of like the English version of Beverly Hills 90210. And I directed that for a, a, a long time. But, uh, I was there for about uh, on and off for a year. And then my, uh, I did my first feature. I, 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 but I had been shooting little things like pop videos and uh, short films. I did 20 short films. I did enough short films that you can edit them together and it's a feature film. Mm-hmm. It may not make any sense. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and it was lots of fun. And, you know, to use a cliche, at the end of the day, I love being on set working with actors and crew and cameramen and, and, uh, and having a reason to go to work. Mm-hmm. Whenever there was a lull in the paid work, you know, if the phone wasn't ringing, then I'd say that we've got all these skills. We need to go and just shoot stuff. And so we'd shoot a lot of stuff. And I shot a uh, actor's reel for a friend of mine. And she's now in Hollywood on a three picture deal. Wow. Um, fantastic. Yeah, she's doing really well. I'm very pleased to her. And the, the little reel we shot, because we were bored, is the reel that she took to Hollywood. Hmm. Great. You know, what, what I find is so many people want to run before they walk. And, you know, your story is a perfect example of someone who really took their time to learn the craft. Um, as you say, doing the shorts, doing just the um, assistant camera work, all that stuff from top to bottom. Yeah. Oh, totally. I mean, I, I, I'm a great believer in practice. I mean, if you if you want your car fixed, then you take it to a garage that have fixed cars before. You don't just take it to your next door neighbor and say, look, can you fix my car? Mm -hmm. And there seems to be this thing about filmmaking that the first time you do it, it's got to be right and perfect. You write a script and you just write 90 pages and it's done. Or you you get your friends together, you go off and shoot a film and it's done. And I think you've got to practice. All of the guys who are really, really good, they may have made two or three or four pictures that were bad. And uh, the the famous quote is, uh, you learn from your mistakes. Mm-hmm. And if you shoot a, a pop video and it's not so great, well, why isn't it so great? And I shot a couple of short films that were bad, and I just don't show them to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. So let's talk about the shorts. I, I'm a big proponent of doing shorts. And there's this. I find there's this mentality where people think that if it doesn't go viral and get you some sort of a you know first look deal at Sony, then it's been a failure. And and my whole thing with shorts is that you know it's a great. You get a beginning, middle, and end. You get the entire filmmaking process. So it's yes. a great way to start as a writer, as a director, as a producer. Maybe you can speak to that. That's my short DVD. Available uh, in a shop near you eventually at some point when I finally finished doing it. So if you even get stuff inside, look at that. Very nice. I, th- I think, you know, sometimes people make shorts because they say it's a way, it's a, the trailer for the feature. And I think, well, make, make the trailer. Don't make a short. And, uh, yeah. Anyway, that. but I, it's like my previous answer. If we're filmmakers, then we should make films. And we can't afford to go out and make a feature every weekend, but we can afford to get our friends together and our fellow technicians and make a short film. And it's great fun. And you can practice because if you're if you're doing a big feature, like when I worked on the big films, the director is constrained by many other vested interests, not just the financiers, but the producer and the screenwriter. And if you've got a a high uh, level actor, they may want to have a lot of input as well but when you're doing a short it's one of the few times in your career as a director you have total autonomy and purity of control and I'm not saying that because I'm a control freak quite the reverse I very much welcome my cast and crew's input because mm-hmm. if you say something that's cool well I'll take it and make a better film I'd never never say no I mean obviously sometimes people say stuff and it's really bad and you have to be diplomatic and say that's an excellent idea I'll write it down write it down and then do something else um but with shorts it's your film and you may not get that chance because if if you make your little short film like i made a, a, this film arthur's amazing things years ago 
I made that one. Ta-da, there it is. And it did very well. And that the BBC liked it and they phoned me up. And then, of course, I got the job I was talking about. But in that job, I'm just the director. I don't have anything to do with the script. I don't have, I have very little to do with the locations. I don't get to cast because the actors are already established. You just cast the actors of the day. You're just doing episodes. So the funny thing is they hired you because you were creative and you created the whole film and you wrote it and the world. And then they just want you to be the director. So you suddenly just have one role. Mm-hmm. Uh, Let's dig into that a little bit. So um, first off, when you this Arthur's Amazing Things, what number, how many shorts had you made before you made that one? Uh, well, I did two. I did two shorts at university at college, which uh, were just practice. And then I did one, uh, two, three. So that was the third short I did. OK. And then how did what was maybe you can give us some sort of, you know, actual logistics. How did you get that to the BBC? How did you actually get it so that it got seen and, and, and got some success? What, what did you actually do with it? Well, uh, I mean, this is a few years ago. This is 2002. I made that and uh, I shot it on 35 mil and I went to all these labs and I said, can I have your short ends? And because I already had a relationship with them as a loader, as a second AC, they gave me loads of short ends. So we shot the whole film on a minute of of film and then two minutes and blah 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 and then uh, it took a while to do obviously uh it shot on movie tech cameras wonderful cameras and uh when it was finished there this this is as i say 10 years ago there were less festivals and i didn't know anything about film festivals at all i was completely ignorant but obviously i knew of the bbc and the bbc were running this thing called bbc talent i don't think they still do it and you sent in your film and they, if they liked it they uh invited you to a special screening in Bristol at this lovely film festival. I strongly urge you, if you ever get a chance, Brief Encounters for Short Film Festival, one of the best uh, in the UK, possibly the world. And um, we went down there and I didn't win. I came second, but that got me the intro to meet the guys uh, who employ people. Mm-hmm. So it was, it, it, I didn't make the film with the intention of getting a job. I just wanted to make the best film I could make, you see. And mm-hmm. I think sometimes people make a film just to get a job, but I think that's a showreel. Do you see what I mean? Sure, sure. And if you and and the the great thing about making a short film is you can have the purity of your own story. So you say, this is the story I want to make, and I'm going to make it. And. Uh, Obviously, you've got to raise the money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So one of the things that intrigued me about your story was that you wrote, produced, directed, and found funding for these two feature films that you have coming out this year. So let's yeah. dig into some details on that. Um, which one was first, death or um, – Death is first, or, yes. Death my, was first. My, okay. My so death the, was first. So let's just um, – as I said, take a step back and dig into that. Um, you know, what did you do to go um, – There it is. Perfect, perfect. And this one is now is, is screening in Boston right now? No, no, this one is available on DVD. Oh, okay, okay. You can buy that on DVD in America. It's called After Death in America okay. and Death in the UK for reasons that are far too dull to go into. <laughs> okay. So, well, let's, let's dig into sort of the logistics of the film. So you wrote the script. You have all these connections in terms of knowing the, the craftspeople that you need for the film. But how did you go about raising the money? Uh, well... I originally wrote a a screenplay called Were Pig, which is all about a girl who turns into a pig, like a werewolf, but a pig. Uh, It's very (laughs) silly. And uh, we thought it was great. And uh, we wrote the script and we went everywhere. went to the BFI and the film council at the time. And I spent 10 years trying to get the money. And I came up with nothing. Absolute zero. I think I had one penny. (laughs) And uh, and that was it. Uh, so I felt very disheartened and I thought, oh, you know, I, I might give up, but I couldn't. And what up. kind of budget were you working for a wear pig? I, I, about a hundred grand. OK, so not a huge budget. Uh, in, in a... One hundred and fifty thousand dollars, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't I just couldn't get any money. And uh, so I wrote another script and another script and I've written quite a lot. And now uh, at this point, had you had you done the directing like on these two TV shows like you. So you had a career at this point yeah. when you were trying to raise the money. It wasn't just like you were a total novice when you were going out to try and get the money. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. I had okay. a track record and uh, and I did a master's in screenwriting like later on. I mean, I graduated and then 13 years later I did the master's. And uh, I so I thought I've got to write a script that is cheap. It's the classic, classic, you know, um, 
uh, low budget premise you know you've got one location you shoot everything how many films are there set in a bunker and how many films are there set in a cabin in the woods it's it's because it's cheaper to make that you know you, you get all your crew in one location and your cast and you can house them and feed them and they're there the whole time and if you want to film a little bit later in the evening they're not all going to go home because there's yeah. nowhere to go so you've <laughs> you've kidnapped your cast and crew i mean sam raimi did it all sorts of people did it and uh, uh so I was trying to think of a story and then a friend of mine invited me away for a weekend. Uh, he had hired this stately home and I went there and, and I arrived the day I actually drove there. I was late at work and I drove in uh, in the darkness and there was lightning and rain and the trees were whipping around like something out of Frankenstein. And I just thought this place is awesome. And you say you said he hired this place. Um, that means he rented it for a weekend just for fun. <laughs> Yeah, okay. and he invited he invited about a dozen people. We all went over there, and we all had a great old laugh. Uh-huh. And I just thought this place is amazing, and uh, it's like an artist's retreat. So it's not that expensive. It's not like hiring a hotel. You just hire the room, uh, the the building, and you have to cook and do everything yourself. Okay. You know? yeah. I don't know you'd call that in America, but like. A, no. A, yeah. Yeah. There's certainly. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of a thing. A rental. Yeah. A house rental yeah, just or something. Rental. That's it. And. Uh, because it's an it's like an artist's retreat, a writer's retreat. It's not very expensive. I mean, it's not cheap, but it's not expensive. And uh, then I went away and I thought of the story and I got some actors together and I and I'd worked out the plot uh, and I decided on my my characters and I wrote very very detailed character profiles for each of the five key characters and then I hired a a, a rehearsal space in uh, London and I cast five actors, uh, four I knew. And one who had come to me and said, I'd like to work with you. And I said, well, come and come and do a day for me for free and let's see if we get on, you know. Uh, And she was excellent. And we workshopped and I hate that term, but we workshopped the five scenes, which I call the tentpole scenes in the movie, the, the beginning of the film, the end of act one, the middle of the movie, the end of act two and the end of the film. So the five key moments and we workshopped them for a long evening and I filmed everything on a little flip camera. And then I went away and I wrote up every single word and, you know, exclamation and gasp that they said and gave me 48 pages of pure dialogue. Hmm. And, then that and I started stripping it away and working out which is good and which is bad. And then I put that in the, the story plot arc that I already had. And I knew it was all set in the house because I'd seen the house. And that was my story and that was my script. And then I wrote it and it, uh, it took it only took about two weeks to write it once I had it mapped. Out. And uh, then I, we went for, to the location uh, for a long weekend to uh, practice the whole film, rehearse the whole film. And we had a couple of extra hours. So it, it sort of organically came together. And because it was all one location, uh, that was that was the only big expense was the hiring of the location and getting everyone there and all that sort of things. And virtually all of the crew and actors were either people I'd worked with before or my friends. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't asking any any anybody who I didn't know to come along and work for me for free. Because I think sometimes low budget filmmakers feel that they, they have a divine right to make films. And if they make they make people will come like Kevin Costner, but Kevin Costner gets paid. Uh, <laughs> and like Shileman for that matter but um, and quite a lot of money I hear um, whereas I'm not asking anyone to turn up who I don't know mm-hmm. you know like on, on, on the weekend you might go down the park and play football with your friends you don't ask people to come and play football with you who you've never met sure sure so what is what did the budget end up being uh, well I, we didn't have any money same old thing and, and I, I thought sod it I'm going to make this film whether or not we get any money so I knew I, I know three very rich people and I went to each one of them and they all told me to sod off <laughs> and they wouldn't give me anything at all and I, I got I had more in a week than I do in a year and they wouldn't they wouldn't help just wouldn't help and I and I almost begged and I thought no I can't beg for money that's wrong um, so I scratched my head and my friend uh, Jeff who is the guy who took me to the house in the first place he said, look, I know someone. So we asked them and they gave us £250, which is nothing. And that's 
we thought, oh, but hang on, what if we ask everyone for £250? And this was, you know, people weren't really crowdfunding three years ago. Now everybody crowdfunds all the time, but it wasn't really at its level it is now. So I said, OK. So I asked every single person I knew within reason for £250. And, a, and I raised a lot of money. But it never came in in one lump. It would be, I set up a business and I set up a bank account and blah, blah, blah. And you'd get a, a 250 quid would come in and then 300 quid would come in and then a, a thousand pounds would come in and then nothing would come in. And then 250 and this money sort of trickled in. Uh, and I don't think we ever had more than 3000 quid in the bank at any one time. Hmm. Uh, so, but, uh, but I set a date, uh, uh, 31st of December uh, 2011, I said, we've got any money in the bank account, this brand new pristine bank account on that date, we will make the film. And if we have no money in the bank account, I give up. You know, it's God telling me, don't be a filmmaker, go back to the forest service and be outside. And um, I woke up in the morning, I remember it distinctly, and I typed in the code and I opened the bank account and it had zero in it. it had a single, not a single one of them. And uh, I was gutted. So I got on the phone and at the end of the day, we had 3,000 pounds in the bank account because I just had to go and hard sell it and uh, and that was the most amount of money we ever had and you when you say hard sell it's literally calling your friends and saying listen can you can you put 250 <laughs> it's nothing nothing special <laughs> it's like Bob Geldof said give us the in money you know uh -huh. uh, and I think a, a lot of people it, 250 pounds you know what's that $400 it's a lot of money it's not an insignificant amount of money but it, it's you could get fined that for a tax evasion easily or a car problem or, you know, your car breaks down, you get a bill. It's not insignificant, but you can cope with it. If I was asking people for a thousand pounds, they'd say no way. Uh, but I've, but and um, people are very generous, you know, and, and people would say, well, I can't give you any money, but I can give you this uh, and lend you a camera or a tripod or or an actor would come along and say, look, I'm going to waive my fee, uh, stuff like that. Um, and planning. Uh, I mean, I used to work on really big films, multi, multi-million pound films, and you just see them piss away money left, right and centre. Any, any film that's ever been made by Hollywood could have been made for half the budget if they didn't, if they didn't take, stick their hands in their pockets the whole time. And I mean, you, you, you see... Uh, just endless crews standing around doing nothing all day. And you think, well, why are they there? You know, and I say this as a, as a technician who has stood on a film set doing nothing for many an hour and taking the money. Thank you very much. But when it's your film, you can plan. And if you plan successfully, you can save a huge amount of money by just not being an idiot. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, the amount of times I've seen... They were only going to shoot for one day and then they do an 18 hour day and then they pay for taxis for everyone to go home because they missed the last bus and they missed the last tube. Well, they just spent 200 pounds or quid or dollars on taxis. Well, you should have shot for two days and spent 200 pounds on everyone's expenses and food and, and, the, and a bus home. Mm -hmm. That sort of logic, this, this, this thing that everyone's here, we've got to do everything now and it's ah, chaos. Um, doesn't doesn't so, equate. so you have all these um, these technical production skills. I'm curious on on something like death. What is your experience with post production, the editing, um, sound editing, all that stuff? How did you get that done? Well, uh, I've I've never edited anything really. I had Final Cut Pro on, on my computer, and I'd edited some pop videos and some shorts. I didn't feel confident about editing a feature film because there's so much more going. On. There's various arcs and speeds and stuff, and just the data wrangling. I mean, hundreds of slates syncing up, all that. It's a, it's a headache and you can lose files and disaster. So I was lucky. I, I sort of um, asked around and I found this brilliant editor, Peter Davis, who edited uh, three James Bond films. He edited the uh, Roger Moore James Bond films, you know, 20 years ago. And he was available and uh, he's a really nice guy. And he said, look, I'd love to, love to help. Uh, and uh, so he started cutting. But I um, uh, sadly, I ran out of money 
uh, famous story for all filmmakers. I ran out of money, and even though Peter was doing it for almost nothing, we we just we just couldn't afford to keep him, and uh, which is a great shame. Uh, and he had cut the whole film on Avid, and I was cutting on Final Cut Pro, and I tried to import the whole Avid sessions in, and it cannot be done. I mean, it probably can be done. I couldn't do it, and uh, we had a total meltdown uh with the edit just and i lost a, about three months worth of time because i had to redo every single sinking in final cut but it was boring and very luckily uh, a friend of mine from years ago eddie hamilton who uh edited um kick ass and kick ass 2 and things like that i bumped into him in the street i was walking through soho in london and i went eddie and he went martin and when it got he said you a day in my we went over to um cutting x-men the the new the last one uh and we got one day so we and he fixed all our problems like changed everything out and took it and it saved my life because i'd already spent three months and got nowhere and eddie fixed it in one day uh and uh then i recut the entire film <laughs> uh shot by shot to match Pete's stuff, and that, that was hard, really, really, really hard. But because I was doing it, and I don't pay myself a wage, it cost nothing, you see. Mm -hmm. So that famous triangle, quality, time, money, I've got lots of time, I haven't got any money. So uh, I did it myself. And by doing that, I learned how to edit. And every time I had a problem, I'd just go onto YouTube and type in the problem, and there'd be some little bloke who could say, Oh, you need to do this and that's and I learned how to edit from YouTube. So when uh, I came to do the search for Simon, there we go, winner at this year's Boston Sci-Fi Film Festival. Nice, very nice. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Only had, we won last night, so it's all fresh. And uh, we, uh, I cut it myself because I'd learned to cut. Mm -hmm. But it was, you know, it's like everything. It's a series of random events that meant something happened and if peter had have been able to edit all of death i would probably have never have learned to edit properly because mm -hmm. i'm great i just uh, so that's probably a good segue into the search for simon um is that a similar story how did you raise the money for that basically when when we finished death after death uh i was trying to get into film festivals and sales agents and i just got no from every single uk sales agent i went through them alphabetically a and uh, one of them said no and a lot of them said no very rudely as well <laughs> they don't just say no they say no and go away uh, which is kind of heartbreaking and I went to the Cannes Film Festival I went to Berlin Film Festival I went to um, uh, the Feel Good Film Festival in LA which was wonderful and we got nominated for a whole load of awards and I came out of the screening on Search Assignment and uh, on death and I got offered a sales agent uh, which is great, and uh, he actually turned up and watched the film and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but I'd spent so long in post-production on death and doing the paperwork and the accounts and the sales, I was sick of it, and I wanted to be back on set. I'd some, I felt like I just didn't want to be a filmmaker anymore. I just wanted to be a first AC again so I could be on a film set. So I thought, I've done it once. Let's do it again. I've got all the stuff. I've got... Uh, you know, a little box of red headlights, a little camera, a little tripod. You don't actually need anything else. That's all you need to make a film. Uh, and I thought, I've got to have an idea that costs almost nothing to shoot. And that meant I had to be in the film. See, because if I'm in the film, then there's one less actor. Uh, and because I can operate a camera and I know how to light, then I don't need a DOP and I don't need a cameraman because I can shoot me doing it myself. Mm -hmm. So I've got this logic that uh, if, if it's about a man who's making a film about something, not, not found footage, but a, someone making their own film, that, that is a, a caveat for any bad focus issues or camera, blah, 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 or cock-ups. doesn't have to look a million dollars. And then we have those, those tentpole scenes that I talked about have a big opening, a big closing, a big bit in the middle, and at the end of the two. Uh, so I wrote those, and then a friend of mine came along, Simon Burks, helped uh, craft the film, the script, 
uh, and then we had the script. And I'd already shot a whole load of pieces to camera myself. And um, I, uh, we ended up doing the whole thing for 20,000 £20, pounds UK, which is about, uh, well, it's 1.6 exchange rate at the moment, so $30,000. Uh, and then we have a tax rebate coming at some point, so it'll be less than that. But um, basically, that, that, that was doable because I took that decision to be in the film. And, I, and I, the last thing I wanted anyone to do was think it was an ego decision. It was purely a financial decision. When the film came out, I didn't even put my name on the poster. <laughs> It doesn't. I don't. I'm not even credited as an actor, so I don't. I didn't. It, but it, and I'm. And there's no picture of me, so um, I wanted it to to be uh, seen as a film I directed. I happen to be in it, but I'm in it for financial reasons. But luckily, uh, no one has said that I'm shit yet. So, uh, <laughs> so let's take. Um, let's dig in a little bit to the um, the the. Once you're done with the film, um, how many festivals did you submit to? And I guess we start with Death, since that was the first one. How many festivals? Because one thing that I think people fail to understand, and and maybe filmmakers don't like to talk about, but I know my film that I did in 2008. I think we submitted to maybe 20 festivals. We only got into I think two or three. So there's a lot of rejection, even for films that are seemingly halfway decent. Um, you know, how many festivals? did you get into before you got the one where you got the sales agent, where you started to win some awards? Um, and, and, you know, are there any tips about submitting to festivals? How did you choose which festivals to, um, to go to? Oh, yeah. I mean, the festival, it's a, it's a whole other skill. You know, you can be a focus pillar, you can be an actor, director, whatever, and the festival submissions is an entirely different skill. Uh, and it can be hellish. You've got to ha uh, develop a rhino skin. So when those rejections come, they don't hurt. You go to walk off a dock's back, you know, you open your first thing in the morning, you think, oh, what a lovely day, you know, turn it on and it says uh, Sundance have told you to fuck off. You know, you just, ah, oh. and if you let that bother you, it'll crush you. So, and crush your spirit. So, but the thing to remember is when a festival is programming, they have hundreds of things. And a, a, an average festival only has 50 films in it. You know, a, a weekend film festival, 50 films. Well, they're going to, first of all, they're going to program all, all the films they've made. Then they're going to program all the films their friends have made. Then they're going to program any films that they get sent that have famous people. And then you find that they're actually only looking for two films. And uh, if you think of it like that, you think and they're going to get 500 submissions. The chance of your film getting in, good or bad, is suddenly reduced. It hurts less when you get rejected. And, um, and there's all sorts of other things. I mean, if, if it's a, a, a very specifically a horror festival and your film's a comedy horror, they might just not want it. And they might think it's the best film ever, but it doesn't fit in their schedule. Or if it's a, a very broad festival, like the London Film Festival, they show all sorts of films. If your film is seen by the wrong person, they won't like it. I mean, if somebody sent me uh, Great Expectations by Mike Newell, I would throw that in the bin and set fire to it because I thought it was rubbish. Other people will think that it's absolutely brilliant, you see. So it's, it's just like handing your script out in the first place. You've got to go through that process again. Your script got rejected a thousand times. Your film's going to get rejected a thousand times for no, uh, no reason that makes any sense. Uh, but the way I deal with it... Tell anyone. Like if you're and you go for a thing, uh, don't tell anyone because there's no point in saying, oh, I went up for this role. It was brilliant. It's Roman. It's Centurion. I've got sideburns. I'm perfect for the role. Uh, and they'll go, oh, that's great. That's great. That's great. And then you get rejected. And then each one of your friends will say, did you get the role? And you go, no, I got rejected. So you actually reject yourself each time. But if you don't tell your mum, when you do get a role and you tell everyone, I got a role, I got a role, everyone thinks he gets a role every time he goes up for something. That's awesome. And it's the same with the films. When I got rejected, I never, ever told anyone at all. I don't even tell the producer. It's the only person in the whole world who knows is me. And uh, without a box is is hellish it is like 
entering Dante's Inferno. And the further you go into Without a Box, the more angry you become and the more things you want to throw at your computer because it's it's uh, owned by IMDb. So everyone's going to go there. Uh, it's very user unfriendly. And because it's a monopoly, no one's ever going to change it. It's always like that. And one of the problems with IMDb is that there are lots of film festivals that are not on it. And when you are submitting your film, a lot of people just go to IMDb, type it in, and the list goes, blah, 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 and they go, oh, that's in Vegas. I'd like to go to Vegas. That's in Spain. I'd like to go to Spain. That's in, um, I don't know, Fukushima, Japan. I don't want to go there because I'll get radiation and die. So I'm not going to that film festival. Uh, and they just do it without a box. But a Google search engine will come up with all these other festivals that don't even exist on without a box. Okay, that's a good tip because actually we when when we were making our film, as I said in in two thousand eight two thousand nine, we did use without a box and we didn't go any further than that. There's there's tons of them, and I, 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 it is you know it is sad to say. I think you mentioned earlier about the different tier film festivals. Well, if you look carefully, like I just said, with the they're going to program this, they're going to program that, and you've actually only got two spaces. Uh, can Berlin, all these ones, they're going to have the films with George Clooney in. They're going to do the big budget films, and we cannot compete with Hollywood. There's nothing we can do. We don't have $20 million to advertise and tell things. And whatever, I've been to Cannes 13 times, and whatever they say about it being uh, fair, well, of course it's not fair. If it was fair, then there, it wouldn't just be big budget films that win awards, would it? You know, uh, has there ever been an Oscar that filmed for best Oscar that didn't cost millions of pounds? Well, no. Uh, and have there been films that didn't cost millions of pounds that are better than Oscar winners? Well, yes, of course there has. So it's all it's all bollocks, as we say in England. And um, but you've got to play their game because they are they are to use a Dungeons and Dragons euphemism. They're the games master. You're just the players. And uh, you've got to you've got to come in and do your application and strategically uh, think, will I get in? And if I get in, can I afford to go? Because there's very little point in having your film at a film festival if at least one person from the cast or crew goes, uh, doesn't go. You've got you've to turn up. So if you're, if you're applying for film festivals in Australia, can you afford to get there? And if you have paid your $100 to get into that festival, and you get accepted and you can't go, well, that was, wasn't really worth it. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, I mean, we entered about uh, 35 festivals for death, and we got into about 10. So that's one in three, I think, possibly. Which, and that sounds like pretty good, pretty good odds, actually. You actually did probably pretty well. Yeah, basically, I, I, I allocated £1,000 for festival submissions and then when i ran out of a thousand pounds that's it i put i put no more in but i have a terrible habit of coming home late uh and going on without a box and spending money some people on amazon buy dvds some people buy exotic shoes i enter film festivals and i wake up in the morning the credit card bill is email and you go oh but um you know, so tell us about the one it was in la you said where you found your sales agent yeah, it was great. It was a really nice festival called the uh, the Hollywood Feel Good Film Festival, but it's not running this year, unfortunately. And they were really lovely. And uh, I, I actually was a little bit reticent because the film is called Death. And they're called the Feel Good Film Festival. And I thought, oh, dear. So I emailed them and I said, look, my film's called Death and it's all about people who die. But it's got a very happy ending and a positive message and it's uplifting and it's spiritual and it's all about what happens next. And uh, the woman sent me back an email saying, I'm not afraid of death. Send your film. So I, uh, and we got nominated for best film, best director, best actress, best actor and the audience award. So we very did, nice. Yeah, we did incredibly well. Uh, very exciting for, and we were up our film small budget and we were up against multi-million, well, million dollar, two dollar, two million dollar films 
you know. So I wonder if that's not another tip is emailing the um, festival before you submit and sort of introducing yourself um, because that might actually have influenced whether they accepted you. Yeah, totally. I mean, if you if you can form a relationship with the festival programmers and the uh, the chief people, that's essential. I think uh, the first time you go to a festival, it's a recce, a reconnaissance. So there are many festivals I've been to in the world I've been to more than once. And that the first time you'll go, it's like your first day at school. You're literally finding out where the tables are, where, the, where you, you know, where you can eat, who you can have a lunch with, where the toilet is, and oh, it's, it's time to go home. And, and the weekends go very fast. You go to a festival and it can be over like that. So if there's some way you can go to somebody else's festival and meet the festival uh, team there, then you're going to be ahead of a queue. And anybody who thinks that films are chosen purely democratically is wrong they're not as I- so you're saying you're saying go to festivals though even if you don't have a film enter just go to kind of get the lay of the land beforehand a year or two beforehand yeah absolutely and also you know that festivals are fun they're, they're i love going to them because you meet like-minded people who want to make movies and they may help you make yours uh the in in um the search for simon one of the actors i'm him can so i went to the Cannes film festival to do something else and met an actor and years later cast him in uh, in my film. So mm-hmm. I think you, the, the danger of going to film festivals is going with a very specific agenda to achieve. So you turn up on day one and you think, right, I need to have a million dollar contract from Harvey Weinstein by the time I leave on Sunday. Uh, you may be disappointed. And, mm-hmm. and if you turn up and go, I'm going to have an awesome time, meet loads of people who like films then you're going to not be disappointed. And when you come back home, you're going to go, that was totally awesome. I had an amazing time. Uh, Nothing happened, but I had an amazing time. Next year, I know to bring handouts, DVDs, and money. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So how was was the um, submission of Search for Simon? Was that similar to death? How many festivals did you enter with that one? Uh, Search Simon, uh, we had mu- I had much less money. I mean, I, I made Search for Simon out of frustration that nothing was happening, that I was in the office doing accounts, you know, and bored out of my skull. Uh, so we had, I didn't have the thousand pounds that I did for death. I spent a thousand pounds. I just spent all the money into it. There's no money left. Uh, I didn't have that for Search for Simon. So I, first of all, I went back to all of the festivals that showed death. And I said, I've got a new film out in, within a year. Uh, would you like to see it? And most of them never reply at all. Some of them did. Uh, we got into Rain Dance, which is you know the biggest festival in, in England, uh, and Sci-Fi London uh, showed it. And uh, we had quite a few UK ones, but I couldn't afford to go anywhere. You see, uh, and a Danish festival took it because we filmed part of the film. There's uh, two two important scenes are in Denmark, um, and actually they're actually filmed in England, but I lied. <laughs> Denmark, hooray! So no, there is there is a little bit that I did actually shoot in Denmark, but all the bit inside the pub is uh, in a pub. In England. If you look carefully on all the cans in the background on the shelf, they've all got English labels. See. <laughs> so you went back to the ten festivals you got in with death. You emailed them and said, "Will you take another festival?" And you were hoping that they would not charge you the entry fee. That was the idea there. Correct, yeah. But also because they'd met me and we'd had a nice time and I'd turned up with cast and crew and uh, had been an active participant in their festivals, uh, they, I thought they would be up for it. And a lot of them were, you know, Rain Dance are great, they support us. And the Isle of Wight Film Festival, uh, we went down there, that was lovely. Um, uh, but we didn't, we didn't get into quite a few that we'd already been to. Uh, and then uh, I applied to things like the Monaco Film Festival, which is not on without a box at all. Uh, and they they love the film. They phoned me up at midnight uh, uh, in one evening. And uh, and I thought, this is strange. I don't get phone calls at midnight. And they said, is this Martin Gooch? Uh, we just, we're sorry to bother you, but we just watched your film. We love it. We want you to come, darling. And uh, uh, so we did, went to Monaco and uh, we won uh, the best film at Monaco Film Festival. Uh, very nice. Yeah, it was fantastic. It was very exciting. We got to wear DJs and 
all that. So as far as these festivals and, and, and um, there's the first tier, the second tier, and then the third tier, um, you know, a lot of them, I think there's this misconception, especially the second and third tier, they don't pay for all the filmmakers to go. So, you know, wh- where did you, where you had to get, you had to pay like for Monica Film Festival, you had to actually pay for yourself to go where they actually had a budget for you to come on in. No, I mean, uh, almost every festival that isn't can Toronto and, Venice, you have to pay to go. Yeah. Okay. Only the top tier festivals will pay for your flight and stuff. The, uh, I hate to say it, but being in London, we're lucky because we're closer to so much stuff, and you can get a flight down to Monaco if you look carefully uh, for not a huge amount of money. Uh, whereas if you're in LA, uh, it's a little bit more expensive to get to, to Europe. You see. But the other side of that coin is every city in America seems to have a film festival pretty much and i think so yeah and 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 the i i to be honest in terms of fun the smaller film festivals in my opinion uh, are the most fun or i have had the most fun at the smaller film festivals because you're it's nicer to be a, a big fish in a little pond than a than a microscopic fish in a ginormous pond you know mm-hmm. So let's talk about death and the sales agent that you met. Um, how has that panned out? I mean, uh, the sales agent has then he's taken it out to distributors and he has actually found some distributors. And have you started to see a good return on the film? Uh, well, what, what happened was is uh, we had the screening at the, in Hollywood and I came out and the uh, of the corridor and the guy was there. He said, I loved your film. I'm a sales agent. Let's talk. And uh, in my head, I thought, never sign with the first person that you speak to. So I I did actually say no. Uh, Well, I didn't say no. I said, hang on. Uh, And six other sales agents offered to take the film. But I actually went with the guy who came up to us uh, because he was the nicest one. And if when you're making a pact with not with the devil, but with the sales agent, uh, this could be something that lasts for 10 years, five years, 10 years, 20 years. So I think it's really important to like the person that you're doing business with, because if you're if you've got to email them once a week or phone them and Skype and stuff, if you hate them, it's, you're just not going to do it. So I thought I want to I want a sales agent that I want to actually have a beer with and a chat when I see him, you know. So we were very lucky that the guy who came to us is a really nice uh, guy and they work very hard. And um, we had the film at AFM, uh, not last year but the year before so 2012 which was great and I, I came over I mean I had to pay for my own flight but I came over and um, uh, it was uh, incredibly interesting AFM it's like a huge education in I think it's uh, five days I was there or something I just learned so much and um, uh, but I really wanted a theatrical run you see and I, I, I was you know, my first feature, I was desperate for it to be in the cinemas for a bit. And I sort of said, no, I don't want to sign to DVD straight away. I want a theatrical, I want a theatrical. And the, the months ticked by. And then really, I realized that um, we're not going to get a theatrical. It's just we just don't have the money. You need $30,000 minimum to do a theatrical run or it's a waste of time. And uh, finally, my agent sort of said, you know, you've got to set a, you've got to set a date when you're going to say, OK, we give up on the theatrical. And I did. And the second that that date passed, they got us some um, DVD distribution and VOD. So they'd sort of been waiting for me to to make a decision. Uh, and then we came out on VOD uh, on DVD uh, on the 21st of January. So just last month. So we haven't got any sales yet, uh, any returns because we haven't done the accounts. Mm-hmm. Where did you get these other five sales agents? They were from the same festival. They saw the film at the festival too. That's right. Yeah, they all they all came from the Feel Good Film Festival. So on the on the festival in Los Angeles, um, do you think the reason there were so many sales agents there was because it was in Los Angeles? Because I've heard a lot of distributors have told me when I was submitting my film, they're like, "Don't worry about the smaller festivals; they're not going to do you any good." But it sounds like there was quite a few dis- um, sales agents at this festival, even though it wasn't a top tier festival. I think I think there's definitely an element of truth in that. I mean, you know, you look you look at the world map, and there are certain centers of filmmaking and LA is clearly uh, uh, the possibly the biggest center of filmmaking in the world so just by sheer chance of numbers you're more likely to get these people to turn up because they live down the road whereas if you're at the um, 
I don't know, the Danish film festival, there's not going to be any film distributors there because they're not going to go there, you know. I mean, things like the Cannes Film Festival Berlin, of course they're going to be there because it's actually a film market as well as a, as a film festival. They're two separate things, whereas AFM is obviously a film market primarily and it has a little festival as well, uh, where something like uh, Rain Dance, which is a really big festival in London, very, 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 very few distributors there at all. Because they they they're going to wait another couple of weeks and go to the London Film Festival. I yeah. see, I see. So let's um talk maybe just for briefly on your distribution for Search for Simon. Um, yeah. How did you get that set up and and how did that go? Well, I, it's the same old story really. After death, uh, after we'd finished death, I and got distribution with that. I thought it would be easier to get the next one, but it wasn't and I phoned up all the people who had said no again and uh, uh, in the UK and I said look you said no on death that's fine it went on and it won a whole load of awards and we've made another film and we'd like you to have first look and they all still said no because they're not interested because it's a small budget film mm -hmm. and the sales agents all they want is who's in it what's it called what's the genre so if you can't say Tom Cruise or Nicole Kidman, well, that was an unfortunate combination, wasn't it? But never mind. Uh, if you can't say Tom Cruise or um, Kate Winslet, but all the sales agents still said no. I got a no, 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 a no. And I, and I thought, oh, I can't, I can't go through this again. It's so, you know, rhino hide. It's so depressing. To, every time you turn on the computer, there's a festival says no, sales agent says no, festival says no, so that you just think, sod it. So I... I went back to the sales agents who had taken death and are uh, and uh, in the UK and USA, different sales agents. And um, I offered it to them. And because they'd taken the film before and we have a relationship, uh, they both said yes. Mm -hmm. I guess the only downside is that, especially since you haven't been working with them that long on death, um, if they're not good sales agents, you, you are now tied with them for two films. That's correct. That's exactly the thought process I had. But, uh, the, you know, how, how long do you wait? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's a classic uh, question. You've made the film, you're doing the festivals. You don't want the gap from it finishing its festival run to coming out on DVD to be two years, you know, because everyone has forgotten. And uh, time moves on. And, uh, you know, I might spend two years making a film, but a member of the public spends 90 minutes watch with in my world and that's it and if they don't particularly like it they will move on and forget about it so you have to you have to sort of keep that in that uh, flywheel of film festivals going through the sales agency bit and the distribution bit to sales so the 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 reviews in the on the internet and in the papers because people read a review and they like the film they want to buy it or go and see it and if they read a review and then it doesn't come out for two years, they'll have completely forgotten. Sure, sure. You need to cash in on that on any positive press that you had during the festival uh, thing. Mm -hmm. So what's next for you? Are you working on another script? Are you preparing to shoot another film? Oh, yeah, of course. I've, uh, I've always been writing. I've written tons and tons and tons of stuff. Uh, and the next one, because I, uh, I wrote Death and I wrote Search for Simon and with my friend Simon helped me on that one. And um, uh, I thought, I don't have to write the thing I'm going to direct, because I used to direct telly and I didn't write any of those. Um, so the next film we are doing is called Alice on Mars. And it's all about Alice of Wonderland and her further adventures on Mars, because she's been to Wonderland, she's been through the looking glass, but she hasn't done anything for 150 years since then, when it was written. So it's time for her to have a new adventure. And it's nice. based on... Alice on Mars by uh, Robert Rankin, who's a, a famous British author and okay. uh, got the rights. And uh, but I haven't got any money. So <laughs> and then, uh, I've written the script. Script's all done. Uh, and uh, now I have to start the um, financial process. And we've also got Death Trap Dungeon, which is Lord of the Rings meets Tomb Raider based on the hugely successful fighting fantasy game books by Ian Livingstone and Steve Jackson. Ian Livingstone went on to mastermind Tomb Raider and the games workshop shops that you see in the high street. And uh, I approached him years ago and I said, I want to write the screenplay on your game books. And he said, yes. 
and it's all done and now we're ready to try and get it out there to the world and and have a and have a decent fantasy i mean this blows game game of thrones out of the water <laughs> huh so um so it sounds like those are bigger budget projects what's your strategy for getting some funding for those uh well i think the what what i've learned uh specifically for me is i don't need a producer i need a financier and I think we get all confused that you need producers and producers have this magical ability to do things. All we need to make films is money. I mean, I don't need another director on set. I don't need, uh, I need my actors and that's it and blah, blah, blah. Certain things you don't need. And I thought, I don't, I don't, I've been looking for a producer, but I don't need one. What I need is someone who can get me money. Uh, and I realised that that's actually me. Like that's, that's what I can do. So uh, we've set up the company already uh, and now the government, uh, the UK government has favourable tax schemes uh, for filmmakers. So we're going to follow that route. It's very, very boring. And I would rather be on set fully focused uh, than doing this. But I think to make a long term sustainable film company, I've got to uh, set up a proper financial structure uh, it's boring as hell and my god i don't want to do it but this is the next 20 years of filmmaking rather mm. because uh, otherwise we'll be scrabbling around on kickstarter for little bits of money for the for the you know and uh, until the ends of the earth yeah sure so what's a good um you know you mentioned some of these movies are out on dvd how can people um find them do you have a website where you're selling them are the dvds available on amazon yeah after death is available on amazon.com right now and if you're in the uk it's available on amazon.co.uk as uh, uh, called death of course the search for simon will be out on dvd in time for the monty python reunion in july so we'll be out on dvd in june or july and my website is really easy it's martingooch.com okay perfect i can link to that in the show notes too so people yeah. can can learn more about you so yeah and uh, you can also people can also buy the book of search for simon which is fascinating, and more excitingly, the Book of Death, which is okay. really nice. And uh, I, it took me two years to write this, and I went through the whole thing, and it's every single scene uh, annotated with the story and how we shot it and what we did. Oh, okay, so, so it's, it's the screenplay and then sort of the story behind all the actual filming of the scenes. Every single scene, yeah, and a lot of artwork. And that, that's the, the proofreading copy, so I've just got to go through it and proofread it. And then it should be ready in a uh, couple of weeks. Okay, perfect. And those will be available on your website or also on Amazon? Hopefully on both. Okay, perfect, perfect. Yeah. Well, then we'll definitely direct people back there. So, yeah, no, Martin, it's been great talking to you. You've been very generous with your time, so I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. See you next time. Just a quick plug for some of my other services. I recently taught a class through SYS Select about how to make your opening pages awesome. The class was recorded and is now available in the SYS forum. So if you'd like to hear the replay of the class, you can check that out by joining SYS Select. We now have seven online classes in the forum covering a variety of screenwriting topics from how to choose your concept to how to pitch your screenplay. The next class is going to be all about how to craft a killer act one. So keep an eye out for that. Details will be in the next episode of the podcast. In the meantime, if you'd like to take a look at all the past classes that we've done at Selling Your Screenplay, go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash online classes. In this episode of Writing Words, I want to reflect a bit on Martin's story. Is there anyone out there who just listened to that interview and thinks, man, that guy sure did get lucky? The answer is, of course, no. There's really very little luck in, in Martin's story. And to me, that's very inspirational. He's not sitting around waiting for someone to tell him he's good enough. He's out there making things happen for himself. It's not easy. It's a lot of hard work. And if you're afraid of hard work, this is probably depressing news. But if you're not afraid of doing some hard work, hopefully you've been inspired to get out there and make things happen for yourself. Martin is, con is in control of his destiny. And if you're willing to do the hard work, you can be in control of your destiny, too. You can get your scripts produced. It's not going to be easy, but it is possible. Anyway, that's the show. Thanks for listening. Good luck this week with your writing.